At time is 7 o'clock and it is Wednesday, August 16th. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 201, approval modification of minutes from the August 2nd, 2023 governing board meeting. So moved. Moved by Ms. Sears and seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes unanimously. Item 301, may I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda, consent agenda? Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo and seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item passes unanimously. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. Tonight I have a few items to talk about in our celebrated excellence. Get School is continuing their commitment to providing engaging learning opportunities for our preschool age children. New this school year at Getz is the creation of their Big Play indoor learning space. This space was intentionally designed to support the social, emotional, and cognitive development of students by giving them an opportunity to engage their gross motor skills. The large learning space has multiple stations that include opportunities for students to build things using different blocks and the, I always put that word, manipulatives. From the building of a life-size Lincoln log house to magnetic tiles that can be transformed into castles, students are encouraged to problem solve, play, and negotiate with their peers. Students at Connolly, Mosley, Shanley, and Ward have kicked off this this school year's with participating with eSports in the classroom. eSports, short for electronic sports, is an opportunity for middle school students to compete and team build through video games. eSports helps to embrace students' passion for competition while fostering collaboration, creativity, and inclusion. This program will help build strengths in problem solving, teamwork, communication, and future ready skills. Katie Moe, Director of Innovative Learning, has shared that her intention is to grow this program to include additional advanced eSports courses that introduce more complex games and levels of competition. Thank you to Katie and her team for helping to introduce this exciting program for our students. Although we are already one month into the new school year, I can't believe that, our community has not stopped reaching out to our schools to offer and give support to students and their family members. Thank you to Elks Lodge 2251 for generously donating school supplies, food, toys, and gym equipment to Wood Elementary. The Elks also generously gifted the school with a monetary donation of 190 bucks to support students and staff. Frank Elementary also recently received a generous donation of school supplies from Celluron, a pharmaceutical and biotech company through a back-to-school supply drive organized by their employees. We appreciate our community for thinking of ways to support our students and staff throughout the school year. Thank you for believing it. We would like to take this opportunity to thank all of Tempe Elementary School District's incredible partners for their recent donation. Specifically, we'd like to thank Staple Store 0262, John Broski, Sandley Booster Club, Valley of the Sun United Way, and Locality Realty for more than $9,000 worth of school supplies and monetary donations that would directly benefit Tempe Elementary students and their family. Thank you to our very own Michelle Grimaldi, Director of Wraparound Services, for her help in coordinating many of these, many of these donations for our students and their families. And that concludes my Celebrate Excellence for this meeting. Ms. Trejo. I don't know that it does conclude Celebrate Excellence. I think we had some big news last week. Um, President Windsor, if you want to share that. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I was obviously very proud to hear that you were selected um, one of 19 leaders to participate in the... Can you tell us about it? Tell us about, about the program. <laughs> No, I don't like to talk about myself, but yes, I was. Um, 
I was one of 19 uh, leaders from across the country selected for the Yale um, Broad Academy. Uh, and it's, it's a real uh, unique honor. They have over 2,000 people try to apply to get in. And so uh, to be a part of this distinguished group is awesome. Um, their main focus is to help leaders uh, in urban areas uh, improve the outcomes for their students. And so we have some of the world-renowned experts in the field uh, that we will have access to for over a year to provide us with expertise and guidance of how we can improve our educational system uh, for our students. And so it is a tremendous honor that I don't like to really share. So thank you for the people who brought that up. Um, but yeah, it's a real honor and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Ms. Trejo, for putting him on the spot, and thanks to social media, we all knew about it. <laughs> I also want to add in about esports because some people may be antiquated like I am. It is legit, it's not just about video games, and like there's a full industry where people are paid big money to participate in it. So I just wanted to put that big disclaimer out there because a lot of people my age and older don't really understand that, and I was right along with them until a couple years ago. So. It's not just video games. All right, and 501, we're skipping because we have no blue cards. So let's jump right to 601, strategic plan update. Dr. Driscoll, is that Ms. Ramos? Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Driscoll, good evening. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to update you on where we are in the district strategic plan and answer any questions that you might have. Um, Dr. Driscoll and I met with our partners from Engage to Learn to recalibrate our focus for this year on the strategic plan. As you know, there are five goals for the district. This year, our hope is to focus on two, uh, goal two and goal four, specifically specific result 2.1, which is tied to blueprint. Uh, as well as instructional practices and assessment, and 4.2, ensuring that our district systems are implemented with fidelity. So I'd like to give you some detailed information on each one of those. So in terms of specific result 2.1, it's broken down into several pieces. Curriculum is our main focus right now in terms of blueprint. Uh, under, the, under the direction of Katie Mo, we have completed phase one for both ELA and mathematics, and we are in progress. Uh, today, we started phase two for ELA. In addition, we started phase one for history and social sciences uh, and science, and we have started the process of migrating all of that information onto our new platform, which is Canvas moving from a Google platform to Canvas, uh, which is much more user-friendly and more intuitive for our teachers. In terms of instructional practices under 2.1, we have worked uh, with Tracy Harvester to develop an instructional coaching framework draft. Uh, we have also worked with our building leaders to start to develop coaching beliefs, the profile and a co of a coach, and coaching expectations. This is in alignment with our strategic plan in terms of developing the profile of a student and the, uh, the profile of a learner and the profile of an educator, as well as establishing our own district beliefs. Um, so we took all of that feedback. In addition, we'll be working with Brittany Franklin's office to send out a survey to teachers to get their uh, take on what coaching beliefs, profile, and expectations look like in their classrooms. Um, upcoming, we are working to develop, uh, so we'll finalize the beliefs, profile, and expectations with coaches at one of our upcoming meetings. And then we'd like to develop or work with a partner to develop coaching competencies as well as a coach recognition system. This is our draft. Um, this comes from inspiration from Engage to Learn in terms of the things that they believe best support our strategic plan in developing our coaches. And so you'll see many of the things that I aforementioned. Uh, one of the other thing, the pieces that we would like to work on is building out coaching assessments, but that will be further down the road. And then finally, for specific result 2.1 under assessment, working with Dr. Brandy Burton, in progress we have both a full pilot and a partial pilot of a benchmark and common assessment platform. 
the full pilot is at Arredondo and Ward, and the partial pilot is at our UVA schools, which is Fees, Florathu, Mosley, and Holdeman. In addition, Dr. Burton is assembling a guiding coalition to look at assessment, um, and so there will be more information forthcoming from that committee. Under specific result 4.2, specifically the leadership portion, uh, all of our DLT members attended an instructional empowerment workshop, and upcoming this Friday, we will have leadership training um, with EAB. That will be a two-part training. The morning will focus on preparing principals for leadership, and the second in the afternoon will be focusing on supporting principals with developing positive behaviors for our students. In addition to those uh, goals that we are focusing on, there are other things that are happening in our district that fall under the other th uh, three goals. So first is goal one. We have some work falling under specific result 1.1 in terms of partnerships and 1.4 in terms of professional development for our staff. So specifically with partnerships, we have worked with ASU to uh, partner with uh, for a math fellowship program. This is very exciting because we'll be providing content-specific coaching for our Algebra 1 and Geometry teachers. In addition to that, they will be doing um, some data-driven cycles using Alex uh, to support their instruction. So we have sent out letters to our building leaders and our educators to gauge interest, and then they will go through an eight-hour training, and then they will be assigned a specific coach through ASU. Under 1.3 in professional development, uh, Katie Moe and her team are developing the program for growing as professionals, also known as Gap Day in our district. It will focus on innovation, social and emotional learning, and high yield teaching practices, and we will have uh, keynote speakers. The other piece of this is that teachers will have choice to select the keynote speaker that they would like to um, participate, with, participate in their session. And then uh, under goal three, looking at specific result 3.2 to identify and reduce barriers uh, to increase enrollment in the district. We have partnered with a group called Everyday Labs, which is a research-based group out of Harvard to focus on our students who have chronic absenteeism. Uh, the, all of our building leaders were trained last week on how to use this platform and then they were asked to go back to their building and develop attendance intervention teams through their school that will then have an in-depth training on the platform. Uh, the intention is that they will meet frequently to look at strategies to reduce chronic absenteeism for our students. So those are the updates that I have to share with you. What questions can I answer for you? Ms. Yours. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just for the community and um, like parents and stuff, can you explain Blueprint um, and then I know uh, Canvas so that they understand what our concept is that we're trying to do with that? Yes, ma'am. So Blueprint is the name of our curriculum projects that we are currently working on. We are determining the what and the when in terms of standards uh, that is all in one central location for our teachers. In addition, we are vetting uh, resources that, have ha that we have found to have high results for our students. We have built this platform in Google, um, and it requires several documents, and so it is being moved over to a, pro a platform called Canvas, which is more user-friendly, requires less clicks, uh, is more intuitive and can house additional information such as things like best practice videos for teaching fractions or uh, embed, we can embed professional development right there for our teachers. So with that said, um, sometimes I get the question of how come in my, uh, my class we didn't have what Johnny's class had or I'm not sure that my teacher is strong in that and not strong in that or it's not consistent. Isn't that the goal and what we're trying to do here is give them tools to really understand the curriculum, have professionals that can help them if they need it, and make it um, more universal from classroom to classroom, school to school? The goal of Blueprint is to provide... I can do that for okay. you. Okay. <laughs> I'll take you off the spot. Yes, uh, it's a guaranteed viable curriculum. And so uh, we want to end the educational lottery. 
And so we don't want you to be at any of our schools and feel like I didn't have that teacher and so my kid, every, every student gets the winning lottery ticket. And we des our teachers deserve to have, at for mentioned the blueprint of what we expect for them. If you, um, I had a, we had Michael Telf here and he said, if you look at the state standards, it takes like 25 years to do. And so we're taking that out of our teacher's hand to say, hey, if you taught the standards, how to stay that line, you'd take 25 years. These are the ones we're prioritizing across our system. So if you're at for Cali and then you leave and go to hold it, you're at the same spot and you have the same, your teacher has the same expectations. But also for our teachers, it allows them to stop the guessing. I don't want them going on teacher paid teachers and saying, hey, I need this resource. It's all there for them. Um, and when it's fully done, and we haven't really shared this with the world because trademark competitive secrets. Um, when it's all said and done, um, our students will benefit, but our teachers will because all our coaching support will be aligned to that. So we will be able to look at our assessments and say, hey, our, our teachers, our students are struggling with this standard, so now we need to introduce PD and help our teachers be able to teach that standard. No longer will a teacher have to spend nights searching for resources because it will all right, be there right there for them. I'm a kindergarten teacher, I click on kindergarten, Everything I'm supposed to do for kindergartners right there. If I don't know something about that particular standard, here's a video that will show you what uh, you're supposed to do and teach that standard. If you have any misconceptions or students have misconceptions, here's the misconceptions that students have. So we're it's a game changer uh, for us, uh, and it's a huge it's a huge project. Um, it, it's probably the most heaviest lift that we will do as a system, and our goal is to be done. I shouldn't say our goal. Our end date is June 2024, um, and so uh, we have teachers involved. I mean, everybody in our system is involved in this because if we do this right, it will change for our students. Uh, it will be the great equalizer for them. So, um, if we, when we do this, um, our system, we, we're going to see a tremendous result in student outcomes for our system and for our teachers. Uh, one of the things the teachers leave is say, I don't have supports. Um, and this has given them that support, but it also is helping us target in what supports that teachers actually need. Uh, you saw in there the coaching as well. Uh, we have coaches in the system, but we need to make sure we can actually measure what are the coaches doing to impact student outcomes. So when you ask at the last board meeting, what's your plan? This is our plan. Um, we're going to attack this first, and then the next step would be now let's look at how we can help teachers be the best teachers they possibly can be. So now they don't have to worry about resources or where they're supposed to go. Now they can focus in on teaching, and then our coaches can go in there and help them refine the art of teaching. Um, it is not a prescriptive, so I've been out of schools and they're like, oh, is this, this program where I'm a robot and I have to do this? No. Uh, it's really our attempt, and I say my definition of curriculum is the district's attempt to uh, unpack the standards and say this is where we want to attack our standards and how we prioritize them through. It is not a program where they'll be scripted. The art of teaching is that. Uh, and so our coaches are there to help our teachers become better in doing that and engaging our uh, students. After all that is done, we will look at learning environments. Um, I was just at Fuller Elementary today and I said, um, if our learning, if we want our students to be collaborative, creative thinkers, problem solvers, our learning environments need to mirror that. So when we walk in a classroom, we should see our students actually doing that. Well, that's a hard task to ask teachers to do when they don't have any tools in their tool belt to be able to do that. And so the blueprint is that first step. It will allow them to do that. Another game changer with the blueprint is we're embedding standards. So um, I talked to teachers today. If you look at our state um, guidelines and recommended minutes, there's not enough minutes in the school day to be able to do what the state says we should do in terms of minutes. We're embedding social studies in the ELA, science and math, math into the reading, so that when teachers teach this lesson, they're hitting multiple standards. Thus, we can create that time for them. Um, and so, when we complete this, uh, it will be one of the crown jewels in our district. Um, we probably will have other people trying to mimic or uh, purchase it from us, um, but we've been very secretive about this because it is a game changer. It's, it's like going to McDonald's and saying, what's your secret sauce? This is our secret sauce.
Awesome. So you went down one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> the pilot for the parents who have students in those schools with the full pilot and the whatever the lingo was of the partial, partial yes. half pilot. Um, what does that entail? Uh, I would ask if Dr. Brandy Burton would come up and speak on behalf of that. So essentially. Okay, so essentially the pilot, uh, we're piloting an assessment solution, and so what this en encompasses for the full pilot, it will be a complement of ELA and mathematics benchmarks that we'll administer three times per year. Those benchmarks will be standards-based um, and mimicked to the state assessment that corresponds. Uh, then we have the common formative assessment component within that platform that our pilot schools will have access to, both the full and the partial, um, and that entails pre-built um, assessments that they are that are built by standard um, down to the specific skill um, and depth of knowledge that they can utilize, um, and then there will also be a component that allows them to create their own. Um, common assessments within their CTMs um, to administer. That is in one part of the platform, that, that benchmarking and the common formative assessment, and both sets of schools will get that, the partial and the full. Only the full will get the additional screening, the universal screenings, and that comes with a full complement of screeners um, that include early literacy um, and just foundational reading literacy assessments as well, that we can use K through eight, which will help to address some of our um, literacy problems that we've been talking about over the last several weeks. Um, mathematics screeners, again, uh, they are primarily focused K three, but we have the ability to utilize those K eight. Um, and then it also has um, developmental milestone screening that we can utilize for things like um, the current uh, state requirement to administer the kindergarten entry assessment. Um, and then we also have uh, behavioral screeners. So our families are already concerned about the amount of testing that we do. Is screening and testing, can you explain the difference? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, universal screening is a process I'm sorry. Um, universal screening is a process. It's, it's essentially a, 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 a assessment that's administered universally across a whole grade level or system um, to identify students who are uh, ready for certain learning or students that may have certain gaps. Um, and so that's a preliminary assessment that we, we give. You've also heard of um, Acadians, I believe. That's a universal screener, and so it's administered three times per year. Um, the testing itself, it's, it's just verbiage. So the benchmark assessments, same three times per year. They're those high-level assessments that we utilize to predict readiness or performance on the end of your state assessment. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just like it to make sense to the community. Yeah, absolutely. And what I would say to that, too, is uh, the board at our last meeting talked about data. Um, these pilot assessments that we're piloting would allow us the ability to be able to tell you in September, this is where our students are making progress on this goal. So later in this uh, board meeting, we're going to talk about student outcome goals. We will be able to, next year, be able to tell you, like, we're here in terms of that student outcome goal. Uh, they will take the place of, so one of the things I hear from parents, and I have a former teacher in our district who I've met with that I hear in the back of my uh, ear. Um, sometimes we give assessments and we do nothing with them. No longer will we do that. The assessments will have a purpose. It will be to inform instruction. Uh, a lot of times we give assessments and the data is useless after we give it. Now we're being proactive, so we use that to inform our instruction. What do we need to do? in terms of intervention or enrichment, and we will have that real-time data. So when we talk about the blueprint, part of that for our teachers is they no longer have to guess where their students are at. They will have the data right there readily available for them, and as they go in their CTMs, start to create actual plans to actually help students so that we don't wait till AASA data comes back and we have 
nothing that we can do with those students because they've already moved to the next grade. We will have it right then and there and start intervening at that point rather than waiting to a test that happens in March and April. So that's the that's why we're piloting it because we we know that our community wants to know. You like as a parent, I want to know where my student is. Um, it's kind of like um, we had this philosophical about our um, parent teacher conference. So. In our district, we have a parent-teacher conference, and the quarter's done. There's nothing you can do about it. Wouldn't it be nice that if our parent-teacher conference were midway, so you have a midway checkpoint to be able to say to them, like, hey, your student's performing right here now this way. Now I still have a whole rest of that quarter to be able to help my students so that now I actually, as a parent, had a chance to help rather than getting the report card and my kid's already done with it. And so it's kind of that same premise. We're trying to be proactive instead of reactive and having real-time data to make adjustments because all our students are at different stages in the game. And so some of our students are way ahead. And so we need to keep challenging them and enriching them. And some of our students need some corrections and that we need to help them. And some of them are just missing certain parts of the standard, not the whole standard. And so rather than giving them the whole thing, we can work on that specific part of the standard that they're not understanding and help them understand that so they can move forward from, and progress. So. Mr. Lemon. Thank you. What I was going to ask, you talked about the what and the when, and I was going to say why. And I think we spent the last 10 minutes explaining why from that standpoint. So thank you very much. That's it. yours. My last question is on the everyday labs. Was that associated with the text message that we got about if your child is unable to make it to school or to make it to school on time? They followed it up this last week with questions of how can we help you or are there services that you need? Was that with that program? Because I thought it was tremendous and I'm hoping that we get, a, get some feedback on what information we got from that. Cindy Duncan is heading up that program and she can answer those questions for you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, this is yours, it was. So that was our kickoff. And we met with Everyday Labs yesterday. We were pleased to find that we sent out the message to about 9,000 homes. And of those, about 1,800 people reached back out asking for some level of support. So what happens when the parents interact with the text is we can link them up with actual um, resources, community resources tied to our zip code where they live. It can be resources where they're on the phone with somebody. Um, there's another mechanism in that that we can link them back up with our social workers, our nurses in the schools. So depending on the questions and the levels of support that families are asking for, then the system really helps the families navigate to that resource. So we were very pleased that 1,800 people did respond the first time around. Um, what we will start doing on the 22nd of this month is the first nudge will go out regarding attendance because we know that if kids aren't in school, they're not learning. So while Blueprint is an amazing tool and we're very proud of it, we need kids to be in school to access that learning. So what the nudge does is when Everyday Labs indicates it's synced with Synergy and when they're noticing a pattern of truancy or potential truancy or chronic absenteeism, the nudge goes out and asks the family again, how can we help? So we're very excited. We're going to be meeting with the attendance committees next week and talking about how do you turn the attendance conversation from a punitive conversation to a supportive conversation. Awesome. This is the most important change that I have seen on how quickly we have done it. So I want to congratulate all of you. And I'm sorry I had so many questions, but I want to make sure the community understands that there's a lot that's gone into this. We're very serious about it, and it's time for community, family, children, teachers to all get on board and participate with this, because I think it's going to make us a lot stronger. It's going to help our children a lot. So thank you, Madam President. And then as you look at student outcomes, look at attendance. Um, and so as you see students, as we looked and saw, you know, hundreds of students not performing, when you go back and you look at the attendance, you see that those same students aren't in school. And so uh, instead of being uh, reactive, we're being proactive to get out, like, why aren't you in school? And so that's 
Everyday Labs does that because we want to get kids in school. We can't do all the great things and provide the services if they're not there. And if they're not there, we need to know why they're not there and link them up. And um, we've called, we started, and Brittany can attest and uh, Cindy, we've called students who did not show up for school uh, that rolled off normally in years past. Say, oh, they just gone and we know they are enrolled some other school. No, we actually called each of those parents and said, why didn't you come? And we've got students to come back to our schools because we reached out and had those conversations with them. And so um, we're trying to do things a little different. Um, this team has heard me say that it is our system. Um, and if we don't change our system, we'll get the same results. We are really turning the system upside down um, because it is that important to us that our students get the outcomes. Uh, that when they leave us, they are prepared to do whatever they want to do in life, whether that's to go to Tempe Union High School District or whether that's to go do something else, that they're prepared to do what they want to do uh, and be productive citizens in our community. And so um, we're, we won't stand pat uh, to, let, to keep getting the outcomes that we have. We will do, try everything in our power so that everybody here, and I, I joke, I told us to Fuller, my real goal is that by the time my kids get to middle school that my wife will say they should come to TD3 rather than being in Chandler because we're doing so much great things here that we can no longer put our kids in Chandler, which is our home school. They have to come here. And I want that for all our employees and everybody in our community that they see no other place to be but TD3. Um, but it starts with tweaking our system. And uh, the blueprint, I call it, is... is it's our plan. It's how we're going to try to do that and tack it. I see no other questions or comments from the board. I'm going to ask, uh, have one comment and two questions. Um, first comment, love that you're addressing the coaching issue. That's been an issue within TD3 for years and definitely needs to be um, revolutionized. So super happy to see that. First question for Dr. Burton, um, those schools that are piloting the new um, assessments, Will they also be taking NWEA? They absolutely will not. They will not be taking NWEA or Acadians if they're in the full. If they're in the partial, they will not be taking NWEA. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And the last question I have is, um, I'm going to tell a little story first. Many of my freshmen coming out of TD3 hate Schoology because they love Google Classroom. I don't understand Google Classroom as a parent because I'm so used to Schoology and have gone into Canvas originally when this all started rolling out. So what determines that Canvas is more intuitive than Google Classroom and is a superior product? I think, if, again, going back to what we were talking about last week, college and career readiness, a lot of universities and colleges are using Canvas. I just wanted to add that in there. My, um, at Columbia, that's what they use. So just for clarity, the platform is for teacher use. Um, so Canvas is for teacher use uh, and is not uh, going to be used by students, um, which is the distinguishing feature between Google and Google Classroom. Um, I have no knowledge of what is happening to Google Classroom unless someone else in the room does. Kate, okay. you want to chat? Um, for Google Classroom, we're still keeping Google all up and functioning. We chose Canvas because of the ability to put templates in. So we have an instructional designer called the Imagineer, and she's able to code behind the scenes. So we are able to have multiple windows open at once, and the functionality provides a little bit more intuition as opposed to Google. When we had our Google um, well, we still have it. All of our documents are interconnected using Google Docs and Sheets and slides and things in this huge interconnected web. We've got hundreds, probably thousands of documents all linked together. And when teachers are utilizing that, they're opening window after window after tab after tab to create this series of informational pieces that they can use in their instructional planning. And when we go to a system, an LMS learning management system such as this, the functionality 
um, creates like little pathways for people so they can easily look between a few windows at one time and navigate with much more ease. There's also the component of where we can have professional learning. So long-term plan, we want to put in our learning opportunities so we can build actual PD within this. Um, for um, Google, it isn't a true LMS because it does not have that integration um, for many different components. And so we're able to track and, and have assessments and different things so we can have our professional learning in there as a warehouse or a storehouse for teachers. And it's all in one place and we're not going to many different pieces and we're not able to do that in the Google Classroom setup with the limitations of that wonderful platform for students. But when we're trying to really connect all these documents, it was a little bit of a barrier for us. Got it, thank you. So it's for employee use, not for students. Correct. Okay, when you say Google Classroom, I only think from student end. So thank you for clarifying that. All right, uh, Ms. Trejo? No, I was confused too. So, because um, you brought that up with your children, that they were transitioning to something different. Ask the question again, I'm sorry. Sorry, because you brought it up that your student, your kids or your students um, and were like, didn't like the new system. Yeah, the Schoology system used in Tempe Union, TD3 kids don't like it because they're so used to Google Classroom and, they, oh, and Schoology is not as intuitive according to them. Okay, I see. But I'm not, I've never been on the user end of it, Yeah. so I don't. I mean, a consideration, I don't know if that is something, Canvas I think is a great tool for students too, and parents. All right, thank, thank you very you. much for showing us. Item 602, Presentation of Student Academic Outcomes. Dr. Driscoll. All right. The tech wizards behind Oz are uh, putting it up on the screen. All right. So uh, last, last board meeting, you uh, asked us to come back and uh, put some numbers <laughs> uh, to our student outcome presentation. And so before we start, I, I guess I should let the cat out of the what is it called, like the cat out of the bag? Is that the phrase? Uh, I was at Fuller teaching, uh, talking with teachers today and I, I kind of shared with them like my ultimate goal. Um, and so I'll put that out there and I don't want to freak teachers out. Uh, so our ultimate goal would be 100%. 100% of our students uh, showing proficiency that they can read by the end of third grade and 100% of our students that leave eighth grade uh, that they have math proficiency. Um, I know the excuses that people will have when you put a bold number out there like that, but what I was sharing to you and what I shared to teachers, as a superintendent, I do not want to go to a parent and say that we set goals uh, that we are already telling you that 20% of our kids won't be able to do and that's acceptable for us. Um, and so what we're showing you tonight is to not freak people out, but know that the real goal is 100%. Um, but looking at our data, um, we have to make small steps to go big. And so uh, I believe, and Dr. Burton can say, say no, you're lying to him. Um, all the goals that we have are higher than what we've ever been in the last five years in terms of student achievement. So all the goals that we're presenting, I'm presenting to you today were higher than any point in the last five years for student achievement. So. The first thing we looked at is by 2028, less than 20% of third graders will fall into the mentally proficient. So one of the things you, uh, we get tasked with is uh, move on to reading. And so any of our students that uh, qualify on the AASA or whatever state test we have um, into the mentally proficient, we have to, by state law, do a whole bunch of interventions from summer school to other things to get them up. And so currently, uh, our three-year rolling average, that number is 58.7%. So I'm saying in five years that we will cut that into a third. Um, if you look at our, uh, that's the projected uh, three to five percent annually, our annual decrease would be six percent. So our current, we get about three to five percent. I'm actually, on our goal, trying to decrease by six. So knowing that by 2028, our average would have been about 6% each year that we decreased that number. So that would be less than 20% of our kids. So one in five kids would score in the mentally proficient. So that was our goal by 2028. Questions on that one? Or do you want me to go through so, them all? So the, no, it's okay. So the annual goal is to decrease the 58.7 by 6%. That's what it would average out to by 2028. Okay. But with, 
with at a minimum three to five percent, because that's what our current rate has been, if, I'm, if memory serves me correct, our current rate, we're decreasing depending on the year three to five, but if we do this goal, it'll be 6%. Okay, thank you. I can keep going. Okay. The next one uh, is by 2028, 50% of our eighth grade students will be proficient in mathematics. Our current three-year rolling average is 21%. Um, and so, uh, again, we're seeing an increase of three to 5%, depending on the year. Uh, so that annual increase by 2028 would be on average 6%. So uh, what I always tell people is say we got 3% this year and then went 9% the next, that would be that 6%. So to get to that number, we'll have to get to an average about 6% a year. Uh, and that's 50%. It's still not acceptable, but when you're at 21%, um, it's realistic uh, to be able to do. And what I would tell you, if I can get our teachers to get us to 29%, then they can believe that they have power and that they can get there. Uh, Fifty percent. If they, if we make that, when we make that, they will see like you can do it, and we can actually get it and move even more to get to that hundred percent. So, I'm taking questions on this one. Thank you, Madam President. My concern here is that. When Charlotte inherits these kids at the high school level, we, um, are you retiring? <laughs> um, literally, we have that many students who aren't proficient going into high school? Yeah, if you, uh, if you, look, at our if you look at our data, that has been historical. So when we met at the tri, or the two district, and we were doing, um, we were talking about goals and stuff like that, I can tease their goals because um, they had graduation percent and their, uh, their data person did an eloquent job to tell us like we can't talk apples to apples because they don't even compare. But most of our students end up going to Tempe High, uh, McClintock or Marcos. And when you looked at their graduation rates, the schools that had the lower graduation rates were the schools that our students typically attend. Um, again, my goal is 100%, but realistically, we have to jump. 6% is a huge average to jump, um, and that's a lot. But what I'm also betting on is that, one, we will have our blueprint done. So that would be a one, and we'll start seeing that acceleration in. Um, my goal is to hope we go past 50%, but we tried to make it realistic so that I didn't have people, uh, when you make a goal that seems unrealistic, people tune it out and they don't believe they can do it, and so they don't. Is that self uh, self fulfilling prophecy? But at fifty percent, I don't know a teacher at, in there in this district or any district can't say that I can get half my students to do it. Um, but this eighth grade won't be it won't happen in eighth grade. It's actually going to happen in the elementary. It's going to start down there and trickle up. And so that five years, so we're saying that, but it's not going to be the current eighth graders. It's going to be our current third graders that we will help and get to that point. So. Um, our goal is always 100%. Uh, one of the gate things that people need to know about, you know, algebra, and I asked this question to our, uh, to some of our team, is like, why is algebra so important? Uh, and it's because we, in algebra, we teach for the unknown. Uh, and it, it, it hurt my heart being a former math teacher because I thought algebra was important because it's algebra, but it's really the unknown. And what are we preparing our students for? It's the unknown. Like, they're going to have to solve for things that we, don't even know about. There's gonna be careers and jobs that exist when they leave us, when they get out of high school that currently don't exist. And so algebra, having a mastery of when they leave our schools of being able to do that, it will help them in that solving for the unknowns and knowing that there are sometimes there's an unknown problem and that we gotta to come together, collaborate, critical think, and solve for something that we didn't have a solution to. So that's the key why when you look at uh, research, why they look at algebra. And so in our schools, seventh and eighth grade are typically I think seventh grade to do algebra one, eighth grade to do geometry, depending on I'm looking at Brady and mine, making that up to seventh, eighth grade. Yeah. Uh, they do that, so. And when you get in high school, normally ninth grade is algebra one. And so when you see the gatekeeper of that, most students want, they get behind as they fail algebra one as freshmen, and then they're already behind the eight ball in terms of graduation. So if our students are coming out and having a, 
are proficient, they have a fighting chance of going in the ninth grade and passing that class and then being able to go. Now our ultimate goal would be that our students could get high school credit here. And so when they get to the high school, they can actually start taking electives and classes that they really want. Um, because I, I liken it to college. All of you who went to college your first two years, they make you take all these classes that you have no real interest in. And then your junior, senior year, you get into the classes that you want. And you wonder why people's GPAs go up drastically in their junior, senior years because they're taking classes that they're actually interested in. So if we as a system can try to get our students as many of those credits as possibly can before they get there, that gives them the chance to be taking classes they actually want to take when they're in high school and not have to worry about those prerequisites that normally are gatekeepers for our students. And then the last one, uh, and I, when I thought of this, I had Ms. Trejo on mine. Uh, eighth grade civics. Um, our two-year rolling average is 67.6%. Uh, uh, our goal is by 2028 that 90% of our eighth grade students will pass that civics test. The last meeting we had a, a, quite a discussion about like the civics test, and I think it came to light, to light that um, that's similar to the immigration uh, citizen naturalization test. Um, and so I tell people our U.S. history really hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> depending on here. And so uh, if, we're, if we're really good, uh, our students, I believe, should be able to do that. that that's a reasonable goal um, for our students. And it's important that they know our history. Um, so that, that's why we did 90%. Mr. Lemon. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I think all of this is fine. I don't have a problem with it. Um, my concern is we haven't talked about science, and uh, that seems to be the, uh, the future where we're going with lots of things, the applied uh, technology, and I understand mathematics and reading, um, but if we don't start introducing the kids early to, to some of the science and the concepts, you know, what's the unknown, how are they going to do it? And so I'd like to see us talk about that uh, throughout this year. We go back to our partners at ASU. Uh, you know, it's one of the top research agencies, uh, universities, uh, right here down the down the street. And I, th I think it would be good if we had a, a program where we could tap into more than just the mathematics, and more than just uh, some of the reading teachers, and uh, really take a look at science. I had a sneaking suspicion you might bring that up. Um, in Blueprint, we embed science throughout, um, and one of the things that we want is that our students get it throughout their education. So what what you tend to happen is in the grades that it's tested, especially in elementary, you see a focus, but in the other, that's the class, or social studies is the class that students tend to, like teachers, like I don't have time in my day to do. Uh, it's important for us that our students get exposed and actually know science as well. Uh, and so along that lines, I think it switched, the, did it switch to fifth grade? By 2028, 100% or die trying, but um, we want our kids to be that. We want our students to be well-rounded. Um, and so any of the areas that we have, every, you know, and we didn't even talk about fine arts, PE and all that, all those are critical for our students and our students will accelerate or excel in some of those areas. And so, we have to make sure that we set our students up for success or stuff that is mandated by the state that we have to. But there are other areas that um, students see success in and they can actually shine and that makes them want to come to school. Um, I'm a big proponent and I tell people all the time, when I played sports, my GPA was much higher than when I didn't play sports because I was motivated, but I saw success. Um, for some of our students, they don't necessarily see success in some of our core areas and what we tend to do is we say, hey, you struggle in math, so I'm going to give you another math class, and I'm going to take that elective away from you that might be the reason why you come to school because you really love it. Um, and so what we're looking at is how can we embed that in? So, for instance, science. Like, I might struggle in science, but I might be great in culinary art, or I might be great in engineering, or I might like aviation, and all that stuff 
factors in. We have that embedded into those classes, so students are getting interest, the things they're interested in, but they're also hitting those standards as well. And then guess what happens? They end up achieving the science and social. So yes, we're not forgetting about science. Um, it's embedded in pretty much everything we do. Um, we want our students to make sure that they have all of that that they're supposed to have. Thank you. I see no other questions or comments from the board. I just have a couple things to add. I specifically wanted to mention the format of this. Um, super much in love <laughs> with the format, having the long-term goal with all the breakdowns of the benchmarks along. I think that's a really wise way to present it, especially for, and I understand on the teacher end, seeing 90% and choking as a social studies teacher, like, okay, well, we've been at 67. Like, oh, okay, there is a plan for us to incrementally move that direction. It's, how we want to work it for our children, and it's how we should expect um, the adults to approach it too, so I appreciate that thoughtfulness. Um, and then in terms of um, why not science, uh, reading is the component that supports all subjects, so we definitely have to improve that before really we can start dreaming about everything else. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the restructuring of the district office and the innovation and and STEM and all of that has been definitely highlighted. So I, I think that Driscoll and the team are in lockstep with, with that request. Um, and then the last thing I was gonna say, I actually forgot, so that's it. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Thank you very much, Dr. Driscoll and Dr. Burton. Appreciate your investment in that and bringing it back to us. I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Burton. Uh, she had to sit and endure my questions and uh, my lack of knowledge sometimes, and so she helped me uh, make sure I was clear. So I want to thank her because uh, it's a lot coming to my office and me asking you 50 million questions to make sure that I understand it, and she was uh, really nice to me. Uh, you have that candy, so. That's true. That's true. <laughs> thank you so much. Right. Item 701, discussion, consideration, and possible approval of the updated community use of facility schedule. Before we um, have any vote on this, um, Dr. Driscoll, would you please just give us a little background on why this has been brought to us? Or somebody. Uh, well, what I would say is uh, last year, uh, when looking at our fee schedule, we hadn't updated our fee schedule um, in some time. Am I, am I making that up here? I believe it was 2011, maybe. And so um, we wanted to be consistent, but really what I, what I really wanted to do is take out the subjectivity um, and so that our community knows, like, hey, we want you to use our community, but here's the fees, and then look at what our neighboring districts to make sure we're kind of in the same ballpark so we're not charging more or less than uh, in that. And so what I test Eric and uh, Mr. Anderson over here, uh, to look at our fee schedule uh, and to bring, bring us something that we can honor what our community wants. So, uh, you know, we have a big attention of uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts who utilize our facilities. Uh, and I wanted to honor that, but we also have the law with the gift of public funds. And, um, and so we, we play that double edged sword. So we wanted to create a way that our community can use our facilities because we're very thankful for our community because we have these facilities because they go out and they vote on bonds and say, hey, build new schools. So we wanted to do that, but we also wanted to make sure that we just weren't giving taxpayers money away and saying here. So I, I believe the fee schedule that was proposed that you have in front of you is uh, pretty darn um, good and fair. Um, we, uh, we looked at agencies that normally rent our facilities and said, hey, if you have a certain percentage of our students participant in it, we think you should get uh, a, a discounted rate into uh, our facility rentals and stuff like that. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Eric and Ryan for uh, specific questions that you might have because uh, they, I, I kind of tasked them with this uh, scope of work. Ms. Trejo? Thank you, Dr. Skull, and, and um, appreciate that we have lent our facilities out to our community partners. I know that they definitely have appreciated it. Uh, and as with change, I know you've give them kind of a heads up that this was coming. So those ongoing folks, I'm sure were aware. I hope. <laughs> Just most of them had a year. Okay. Uh, and 
what I've told them is that we would follow our own policies and we would make a up, we probably would make an update for this coming year. But I would honor some of the stuff that we've had in the past, and that's what I, uh, Ryan and Eric did such a great job with. So yes, they had a year. The, the people that inquired. Right, thank you. Um, my question is: these are obviously pretty fair rates, in my opinion, um, but a little bit of concern um, because if you know I looked at venues for my wedding and that is a big thing and if I want to have a wedding here it would be very cheap um, not that I would but but a concern about safety and security and you know maybe someone has a wild party like how do you ensure that this is safe for our our facilities and our, our district our school community yeah so one of the I guess I'll and then Ryan and Eric if I'm like way off base you just say hey cut it um, all of the people who rent our facilities have to have a certificate of insurance. And I want to say the liability is like $1 million. And so one of the things how we cover ourselves is if anybody's utilizing our facilities, so if they're having a wedding, they have to have that uh, on file so that if they do create damage, we're able to go and bill it against their insurance in that regard. So that's one way we safe, uh, protect ourselves. In some cases, depending on what they're utilizing the um, facility for, we require them to have a custodian or security or extra people on, um, and there's fees associated with that, I believe, in a fee schedule as well. So that's another way we do so, depending on the usage and what time of day they're using it, um, we actually have extra charges for them um, that they have to do. If they're utilizing our technology, um, we have fees in there that we will supply them because we don't want everybody, just anybody using our technology because they break that and people come to school the next, that next day, so they're in on Sunday and break it, then our kids suffer. So we, uh, we have ways where we have fees that say, no, we'll provide you with that person that knows our district equipment and will run that and be at your disposal for an additional fee. So we try to do that and balance that in um, as well, so to protect the district for that because you know, though we love the community that utilize our facility, you know, 90% of our facilities are schools, and those schools are in use by our students. And so we can't afford for them, our students to come in and not be able to have access to things they had the previous day. Um, and so we put those kind of safeguards in as well. Um, so obviously all this is contingent on our spaces being available uh, and, you know, all these parameters are in place. Um, yeah, I was just thinking like if someone has a, a, a big event and it's impeding traffic and, you know, Im impacting our, you know, learning environment, things like that. I'm just wondering like is there an occasion where you can say no because I also, I understand during the sensitivity yes. but there will be events that may come up that may, you know, be harmful to the learning environment. Yes, uh, and we do have that, we do have that ability to say no. Um, and so one of the things we ask is when they uh, fill out the facility rental, we ask for specific things of what are you using the facility for, what type of activity will be going, taking place on there. And if we see you have questions and we come back and say, hey, we have questions about this. So we know the Trey Hall wedding and having 500,000 people. I don't know that Mosley can uh, house 500,000 people, so we would probably say no even though we like you. But we have a great space so if you want overlooks, you can see the mountains, uh, it's a very great location, um, and we can get, I think we can rent it out for a really good price. Um, this, this is a great outdoor for your area too. Uh, and, and, and we have catering, so in case you didn't know this, we have district catering and we have a whole menu, so we can cater, I'm just letting you know, and then if you're listening on, the, on TV or on YouTube, we have district catering too that we can help um, part of it, so we can do that. This could be a very affordable option for, for some folks. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I did have one question besides planning my own daughter's weddings. Um, I vaguely remember a conversation, um, and I could be wrong, but I would like to see a double or asterisk on elementary school library. Just yes. so that if um, district equipment is used, the district technician or a qualified employee must be present. I think with libraries, there's always kind of an assumption that there's media there or technology there. So I think it would just remind Yep, we'll make, that up. we'll make that up. All right, um, any other questions or comments or we have a motion? Can, can I just follow up really quick with yes. what President Windsor said? Um, yeah, it does, just to confirm, they won't be using our technology. 
or a Wi-Fi. Unless they uh, explicitly ask for it, and if so, if they're using our technology, we have a fee that we have a district person that would be the one there. No. So it would be a district person, not them using it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then if you guys make a motion, will you just make sure you put in there that, that extra star uh, so we can do that too. All right, Ms. Yours. Thank you, Madam President. Is this hourly or daily? Okay, just want to make sure. Daily, no. It would be awesome, but I just wanted to make sure the public knew it was hourly. And do we have the availability, I know you said we have the availability to say no to someone. What Are there a lot of rules to that, since we're a public building? Uh, those requests go to uh, Dr. Hudson and Mr. Anderson's department, so I'll let them <laughs> handle the, uh, the yay or nay on that. Yes, uh, that is correct. Um, any request go to the principal so that they can evaluate it first and make sure that the building is available. And then we also send them to our facilities management as well so they can, if there's any issues with fields or other buildings or there might be a conflict, um, they can let us know about all that in advance before everything's finalized and approved. I think my question is if there's something that, like Monica had said, that is not education conducive or negative to public education, are we allowed to say you are unable to meet on our property? We have to be consistent. Um, and so one of the things I, one of the things I uh, say in another district, if you know, we have a lot of religious institutions, if you allow one, you have to allow them all. We cannot discriminate, we are not uh, practice. And so really we have to be consistent in that. One of the caveats that we, uh, we are also discussing with uh, our legal counsel is putting in that though people are renting our facilities, their views are not the views of Tempe TD3. Um, they're not affiliated with us, and so just because they rented our facility doesn't mean we condone what they say or do, because um, we can't control what other entities might say or do when they rent our facilities. They're renting our facilities, and we have to have this stuff in there to be non-discriminative, so we can't say we won't rent to this and that. But we look at it and evaluate it and make sure. So. Also, want to confirm, like I don't know if they'll be aware, but the same policies and procedures related to facilities and obviously our state statutes and things would apply. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, like, there's no guns on school campuses and stuff like that. So all that stuff still applies. I appreciate questions to give Mr. Anderson to speak so that we can hear his voice again. <laughs> um, any motion? Anybody want to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the updated community use of facilities and fee schedule. A second. I second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Ms. Sewers. All in favor? Aye. 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 I know passes unanimously. Robust conversation, people. Oh my goodness. 702, discussion, consideration, and possible approval for Tempe Elementary School District Number 3 to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Tempe for the Studio Artist Program. Do we need a background on this, or are we ready for a motion? Uh, I'm ready to make a motion, but it sounds really cool. Go ahead, Ms. Trina. Uh, that was my motion. Okay, oh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the Tempe Elementary School District Number Three to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Tempe for a Studio Arts Program, as recommended. I second. Oh, go ahead. Moved by Ms. Trejo and seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I didn't pass this unanimously. Seven oh three discussion, consideration, and possible approval to move the October fourth, twenty twenty three, governing board meeting to October eleventh, twenty twenty three. I believe this is to accommodate um, October excuse me, fall break. Yes, fall break. Um, our current meeting is on fall break, as well, if memory serves me correct. Madam President, I make a motion to approve the meeting from 12th
Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Moved by Mr. Lemon and seconded, seconded by Ms. Trejo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes unanimously. 704, discussion, consideration, and possible approval of Tempe Elementary School District student academic outcome goals. These are the ones that were just presented in, in uh, presentations. I'd like to make a motion to approve the Tempe Elementary School District student out academic outcome goals as recommended. A second? I'll second. Moved by Ms. Trejo and seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. 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 passes unanimously. Yay. 705, second review, oh, this goes into all of our second reviews. 705 is second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy GCC, GCCC, professional support staff leaves of absence without pay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed changes to governing board policy GCCC, professional support staff leaves of absence without pay as recommended. And a second. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. 706, second review and adoption and proposed changes to governing board policy GCCG, professional support, staff voluntary transfer of accrued leave. I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed changes to governing board policy GCCG, policy, professional support, staff voluntary transfer of accrued leave as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. 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 I didn't pass this unanimously. 707, second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy GCCH, professional support, staff bereavement leave. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve proposed changes to governing board policy GCCH, professional support, staff bereavement leave as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I didn't pass this unanimously. 708, second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy G. F support staff hiring. I'd like to make a motion to propose changes to governing board policy GDF support staff hiring as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. Item passes unanimously. 709, second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy GDFA support staff qualifications and requirements. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the proposed changes to governing board policy GDFA support staff qualifications requirements as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lumen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes unanimously. 710, second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy IGA curriculum development. I'd like to make a motion to approve the proposed changes to governing board policy IGA curriculum development as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo and seconded by Mr. Lumen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I didn't pass this unanimously. 711. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. Second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy IGD curriculum adoption. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the proposed changes to government board policy IGD curriculum adoption as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. I didn't pass this unanimously. Last one. 712. Second review and adoption of proposed changes to governing board policy IJJ textbook supplementary material selection and adoption. I'd like to make a motion to approve. <laughs> sorry, I'd like to make a motion to approve proposed changes to governing board policy IJJ textbook supplementary material selection and adoption as recommended. Second. Moved by Ms. Trejo, seconded by Mr. Lemon. All in favor? Aye. Item passes unanimously. 801. Any questions about the student activity report for June 2023? Excellent. 901. Board members' points of information. I'll wait for lights. I just want to um, first start out thinking about President. I want to start out first thanking all of the restaurants in the valley who are helping our schools. Um, I've been going around, and if I see a little sign that says "Support Rover," "Support Woods," "Support," I'm like, that's where we're having dinner tonight. So um, I just want to make the community aware that you can go in and say, "I'm here for this," and I'm supporting our schools. And so many of them are coming out. I mean, it's all over the place. So I just want to thank them for that because it's a big deal. And thank you to the parents and the families that are also taking their kids to support these restaurants and continue because so many of them are our local partners and they're our friends. So um, I just wanted to thank on that. Uh, I received a call um, from some friends of mine in the police department. There's a lot of our kids right now that are needing some help. And we have a lot of parents who are having a hard time. Um, so please know, and when I say they're having a hard time, um, there's been an increase in child violence over the last few weeks. Um, and so I want to make it very clear that we have support here at our schools. Go to your 
teacher, go to your principal, go to your school, or just come straight to the district office. And I'm saying this specifically to parents because we always think that the schools are just about the kids. But I have spoken with a couple parents in this last week and I let them know that raising a kid is not easy and there's also help that you don't have to pay for and that our community in Tempe is very, very good at mentoring families with this. And they're also very, very generous and considerate. And sometimes people say, well, I mentioned it at the school, I mentioned it to the teacher, and nothing happened. Just call the district office. I have called the district office and I've gotten help. I have friends who have called the district office and they've gotten help. So please just know it's available. It's, it's really hard right now for a lot of people. And if it's not hard for you, you're blessed. And so if you see and you're aware of things, don't be quiet about it. You can, you can say things to people and you can be anonymous and you can get the families the help that they might need. So um, just wanted to bring that up. And thank you for all the schools that did curriculum night. I know curriculum night isn't like 100% attended. Maybe that's something we should add to the list is curriculum night 100% attendance so you know what our goals are. Um, but it was great, and for all the schools and all the teachers, that they stay over time and they help out, and I was able to get a math lesson because I come from the dinosaur ages of math, and there's the new math, and then there's a newer, newer math. Um, so I appreciated it, and to all the families that came out to support it so we could keep doing it and justify doing it, that's important too, and I hope you got something out of it. So um, thank you to the district for putting it on, and thank you for everyone who came, and all of the staff and the parents, and especially the cleaning crews, because it was like having school all over again two hours later. They went through so much. So um, just, I want to thank everybody for that. And it's important. If you can go to those things as um, a mentor to your child, please do, because I promise you, you'll get something out of it. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Lemon. Yes, um, <clears throat> I had to go to the uh, office supply store and before I could check out, the, uh, the uh, attendant asked me that I want to donate to a program where they raise money and give gift cards to schools. And that was pretty cool. And uh, thank you to Staples for doing that. Thank you, Madam President. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, see another other lights. Uh, I just wanted to thank the staff again for the um, strategic plan update and goal setting. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in my tenure as a board member, I think this is the first time we voted on district goals. Is that accurate? It's the last time, first time I remember doing it. In the last five years. So thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. All right. Um, item 1001: Announcements and upcoming events. There will be an agenda committee meeting on Wednesday, August 30th at 11 a.m. Labor Day is Monday, September 4th. All district office, schools and offices will be closed. The next regularly scheduled governing board meeting will take place on Wednesday, September 6th at 7 p.m. here in the Karen Aradona Governing Board Room. The 47th Annual ASBA Law Conference will be held Wednesday, September 6th through Friday, September 8th at the JW Marriott Camelback Inn. And the 2023 ASBA Delegate Assembly uh, will be held Saturday, September 9th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the JW Marriott coming back in. With that, 1101, meeting adjournment. May I have a motion? Madam President, I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. May I have a second? Moved by Mr. Miller and seconded by Ms. Trejo. All in favor? Aye. 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 A